Good afternoon, everybody. So the talk here is from Robert P. George, a well-known contributor to the Napa Institute, the McCormick Professor of Jurisprudence and Director of the James Madison Program at Princeton University. He's going to be interviewed by Daniel Mark, the Assistant Professor of Political Science at Villanova. And the title of the interview and talk is, Where Do We Go From Here? How Do We Navigate These Waters as Faithful Catholics Who Want to Rebuild the Church? It's great to be here with all of you. I want to thank everyone at Napa for having me. It's really an honor to be a part of this conference and especially to be here talking today with my great teacher and mentor, Professor George. As you just heard from Father Ambrose, our topic is, where do we go from here? That's uh, and it's a lot to say about rebuilding the church, but let me just start by asking you, Professor George, to get right into things. If we want to know where do we where do we go from here, where are we? Where is here? Start us with your diagnosis of the state of affairs today that we're going to address when we move on to talking about the cure. We're in trouble. Uh, the church is in trouble. Uh, the country's in trouble. Our, our civilization is in trouble, and uh, the world's in trouble. Um, crisis, major crisis of faith. Uh, it's a failure to uh, understand the basic principles of morality and justice that are proclaimed not only in the Catholic tradition, but more broadly in the biblical tradition, we sometimes call the Judeo-Christian tradition, even more broadly in the, uh, in the great um, Abrahamic uh, tradition, the tradition of monotheism or what sociologists call ethical monotheism, which is shared by Christians, Jews, and, uh, and Muslims. Uh, this loss of faith manifests itself in idol worship, uh, not uh, totem poles or stone outcroppings or golden calves, but rather in uh, the worship of uh, power, prestige, money, pleasure, uh, status, influence, standing, uh, lots of things that are substitutes for God, uh, substitutes in people's lives for what can ultimately be the only thing that brings uh, true meaning. Uh, as uh, so many people have noted, we live in an age of expressive individualism. We care about me, 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 and me. Uh, we've lost the sense of us, of we, of the common good. Uh, we've allowed ourselves to get out of whack when it comes to priorities, values, what really matters in life. We so often, and I'm not just talking about we Catholics, I'm not just talking about we believers, I'm just not, not just talking about we Americans, we more generally uh, treat what is secondary and derivative and merely of instrumental value as if it were primary and intrinsically valuable. And when we do that, we lose our grip on what really is primary and what really is not merely instrumentally, but intrinsically valuable. Well, I've packed a whole lot of things, uh, Danielle, into, a, into an answer to your uh, first question. I know we're gonna have to unpack uh, much of what I said, but that's my fundamental diagnosis. So tell us more now that we've got some of the diagnosis and like you said, lots of unpacking to do. What about the cure? Uh, what would you prescribe as a response to the situation we're in? And particularly and particularly in a gathering like this, I think I'd like to ask you, uh, when we think about the cure, why we should be optimistic. It seems like you're saying when you, when you gave us the theme of idolatry, that this is a recurring problem throughout human civilization and faith can try to resolve that, but it's something that seems to still be with us despite our best efforts and despite the efforts of the church and the faith. And so in telling us the cure, also if you could tell us why you think, if you think, tell us why you think we should be optimistic that there is a cure and that we're not just gonna keep being in the same trap forever. I'm afraid I can't uh, uh, give you any basis for optimism. Uh, and I don't think optimism is what we're after anyway. What we need is not optimism, but hope. Faith is a theological virtue. There's another theological virtue, and that is the virtue of hope. Like all virtues, that's an active thing. It's not just a matter of optics, so it's not optimism. It's placing our trust uh, where uh, it's not misplaced. 
uh, placing our trust in God, uh, placing our trust in his salvific will, submitting our own wills to uh, his will. Uh, those are the grounds, I think, of, of, of our hope. Now, when I say it's a crisis of faith, like most of the great crises of human history, the answer to a failure of faith is a restoration of faith, a restoration of trust in God, a placing of our priorities where they need to be. And this requires uh, what in the great uh, tradition going all the way uh, back to the earliest books of the Bible uh, is called prophecy. The prophet sees the future, but that's not fundamentally what makes the prophet a prophet. The reason the prophet can see what's coming is he understands the past. He understands the great principles at the foundation of faith. So we need a prophetic recovery of those principles. Otherwise, we're going to head right off the cliff where we seem to be heading. We can predict this going off the cliff. We can predict this disaster because we know that's what happens when you abandon fundamental principles, like the principle articulated in Genesis 1 that great revelation originally given to the Jewish people, that man, unlike the brute animals, unlike anything else that we know of in the entire universe, man, the human being, is made in the very image and likeness of God, the divine ruler and creator of the universe. If, in fact, human beings are made in the very image and likeness of God, then we can trust that we humans, however frail, fallen, weak, vulnerable we are, are bearers of a profound, inherent, and equal dignity. And that's the foundation of our lives and of our rights. That gives us a basis for talking about justice. Everybody today wants to talk about justice. They make all sorts of claims on behalf of social justice and so forth. Uh, oftentimes, what is wrong is defended in the name of what is right. This is what is wrong, like abortion, the taking of the innocent lives of the innocent unborn are justified or they attempt to justify them in terms of social justice. Uh, but we can only talk about justice meaningfully if human beings have some inherent value, if there is a basis for the equal worth and dignity of each and every member of the human family. There can only be human rights if human beings have dignity. Human rights, after all, are rights that we have not in virtue of our strength or intelligence or beauty or power or anything else. Human rights, if they exist, if they obtain, are rights we have simply in virtue of our humanity, beginning with the right to life. For there to be such things, then human beings must be bearers of profound and inherent dignity. Where does that come from? The Jewish and Christian story, the biblical story, is that human beings are made in the very image and likeness of God. There's the explanation. There is the account for where our basic dignity and therefore our rights and therefore principles of justice come from. So why don't, we, why don't we pick up right there in order to do some of that unpacking you mentioned. So everybody likes human rights, don't they? And why, and the things that you are bringing up as far as the Bible and the Judeo-Christian tradition, these are things that are bedrock parts of our civilization and our society. So where do you see paganism reasserting itself today? Where do you see this problem uh, when we live in an age in which everyone seems to be a supporter of human rights? Everybody loves dignity and equality. Everybody says they do. And perhaps everybody thinks they do, but not everybody does. And all of us fail in some respects to really understand and honor basic human rights, the dignity of the, of the human person. We see it infecting the political order. We see it infecting the legal order. We see it infecting religion, including the church itself and other religious uh, institutions. The temptation to worship things that are not God as if they were God is as ancient as human civilization or human existence itself. We go again all the way back through the Bible. You, Daniel, as an Orthodox Jew, know this story even better than we of the Christian faith do. Going all the way back to the earliest periods of God calling people to himself, we see the people drifting off into paganism, drifting away from the one true God drifting toward the practices of people who are replacing the one true God with idols, with false gods. When Moses comes down from the mountain, bearing the very 10 commandments of God, what does he find? 
the people who he thought were faithful, faithful to God, the God of Israel, the God who, God who called them as a people, their father Abraham, instead of being faithful, are worshiping a golden calf. Now, where did they get the idea of a golden calf? Again, again from the pagan peoples. So they drift off into paganism. And the same is true for the history of the Jewish people, and the same is true for the history of the church. If we go back to the earliest days of the church, people are constantly drifting off, including people who speak on behalf of the church, find themselves yielding to the temptation to put something else in the place of God. When we see great sins and crimes committed in the name of the church, almost always they reflect this drifting away from the true gospel, from the true God, off into the worship of idols, including the idol of the, of the self. And we, of course, see this in the, in, in the church today, and we shouldn't be surprised by it. It's, it's omnipresent. There's always the temptation to go along with the world. If the world is out of whack with the church, very often people will go with the world, even while claiming that they're remaining faithful to the church. So think of how many faithful Catholics, for example, even today, especially today, how many faithful Catholics, when it comes to issues, it may be pro-life, it may be marriage, but when it comes to issues where the Catholic Church teaches one thing and the editorial board of the New York Times holds another thing, think of how many Catholics are always on the side of the editorial board of the New York Times against the church while claiming that they're Catholics, including some who run for office and hold high political office. Their allegiance is not to the faith. It's not to the moral law, natural law, as proclaimed by the church but rather to this alternative gospel, uh, reflective of the ideology of expressive individualism, as it's sometimes uh, called the dominant ideology of secular progressivism today. Uh, that displaces the God of Israel, the God of Jesus, the God that Christians are supposed to be worshiping. And it can happen on the opposite side of the spectrum as well. You know, we see this in some cases uh, in uh, uh, people who identify as Catholics, but also identify in what they call the alt-right. Uh, so often, you know, we see that it's political ideology. It's not the one of, it's not the one characteristic of the New York Times. It's a different one on the other side of the spectrum. But again, it displaces the morality taught by the church uh, in the name of Christ, the morality given to us, we believe, by God himself who constitutes our nature and therefore are good in, an assert, in a certain way, making it the case that the natural law, the moral law is constituted in the way that it is in fact constituted. Okay, so let's say we've got the theory right here. It's got a pretty pretty hefty diagnosis of the old paganism reasserting itself, idolatry, and while sadly we can't be together and therefore I haven't met the attendees of this conference, I'm gonna hazard what I think is a pretty safe guess that most of the pagan idolaters uh, we're talking about are not in this group. Um, so what do you say then to, to the kind of people at an event like this? What do you say to them about their role in all this? Let's say they understand you. Let's say we got the point about paganism. And it's, it is, again, it's a complicated and a deep point. Uh, but let's say we've grasped that. So we, who are not the pagans, the idolaters, let's say, where do we uh, see our role in going from here, as the title says of this, of this session? Well, one thing I think we have to begin with is a spirit of humility and self-criticism. It's very, very important. Uh, the temptation to paganism and to embrace paganism, even while dressing it up as the Christian religion or the Catholic faith, is not only perennial, that is, it always it happens throughout history and will continue to happen while Jesus tarries. It also applies to every person. Every single one of us will experience in one way or another the temptation to paganism, that is to put some worldly thing, especially some fashionable worldly thing or worldly view, or some worldly thing or worldly view that's fashionable in our tribe or group or clan or whatever it is, in the place of God. So we can't be confident. We always have to be self-critical. We always have to be humble. Humility is a Christian virtue. We always have to be worried that we ourselves might be falling into that paganism without knowing it or without admitting it. We have to be constantly on our guard against it. We need to watch ourselves. We need to be willing to be challenged by other people. Uh, we don't want to be hypocrites. Uh, we, we, we don't want to be uh, the kinds of people who proclaim ourselves holier than thou. Uh, that's not a proper uh, Christian spirit. So we need, to, we need to keep that very, 
very much in mind. We also need to be aware of where the sources of temptation are. In a society like ours, and you and I know this because we, we we're teaching young people who've been formed by this society, in a society like ours, so often uh, what is displacing uh, sound values, true values, by sound values I mean faith, family, friendship, integrity, honesty, love, those, those virtues as well as values, so often what's displacing them is power, status, prestige, money, glamour, self-gratification, uh, the desire to um, uh, have ease and comfort. Those things are what all of us, not just young people, but of course we see it in young people, um, what all of us are, are, are tempted by. Uh, and in a, in a social context that's, that's being shaped by an ideology of secular progressivism and, uh, and expressive individualism, even those who are church-going devout Catholics and who pray every day at dinner and on our knees at bedtime can nevertheless find ourselves drifting into those things. So I think we need to be very cautious ourselves. And then we need the virtue of courage, founded on the theological virtues of faith, hope, and love. We can't have courage unless we have faith, hope, and love. We can't have true courage to fight for true causes unless we have faith, hope, and, have faith, hope, and love. But if we do, if we muster that courage, then we will stand up against the popular wrongs and injustices and evils of our time. It's easy to stand up against the unpopular wrongs, the things that everybody acknowledges as wrong. It's easy to stand up against racism, for example. It doesn't mean we shouldn't be doing it. Of course we should be doing it. And it still exists. Uh, but it, it would be pretty easy for you or for me in our social situation, you as a professor at Villanova, me as a professor at Princeton, to stand up and proclaim ourselves uh, opposed to uh, racism and to participate in marches and things. But wouldn't be so easy to stand up for the pro-life cause, even at Vander even at uh, Villanova, where you are, <laughs> much less at Princeton, where uh, where I am. Uh, how about marriage and the family? How about the sanctity of the relationship between husband and wife in the conjugal bond of marriage? How about standing up and speaking out against a particular form of paganism or neo-paganism, which has become so powerful in our culture today? In which I talked about the last time I spoke at a Napa uh, event, which was a few years ago, and that is Gnosticism or neo-Gnosticism, especially its dogma of the separation of body and self, the dogma that underwrites the uh, uh, current uh, support so broad in our culture for things like abortion, euthanasia, um, uh, same-sex relations and same-sex marriage, transgenderism, the idea, to go back to my previous presentation at Napa, that what human beings are, are non-bodily psyches or spirits or minds or intellects inhabiting non-personal bodies, such that you could have, on this neo-Gnostic understanding, a female psyche inhabiting a male body or, or, or vice versa, or an unborn child, though a human being in a biological sense is not yet a person because it doesn't have yet uh, um, cogn cognitive powers. It doesn't have a, a psyche. That neo-Gnostic dualism of self and body underwrites so much that's wrong, morally wrong, and, and in many cases deeply unjust in our society that is accepted and honored as if it were a great thing. Who has the courage to speak out against those things? And it takes courage today. And as I say, that courage has to be founded on faith, hope, and love. So what I'd say to folks who are participating in this event, folks who are interested in what the Napa uh, Institute is uh, doing, what it stands for, is we need some courage, folks. It's not gonna be easy. It's really hard. You're gonna get pilloried for this. Prophets are never treated gently. <laughs> but we're called to play that prophetic role, to speak out courageously, self-critically, yes. In love, absolutely, in a spirit of love, not with harshness, not with anger, not with bitterness, but still plainly, on behalf of what is good and right and true, the dignity of each human person, the sanctity of human life, the dignity of marriage and the family, and against what's wrong, the killing of unborn children, treating same-sex relationships as if they were or could be marital, uh, standing up uh, uh, against the idea that uh, uh, a biological female can actually be a, a male, or the idea that, that men can give birth to babies or 
or whatever the latest fashionable thought thought is. It's not easy to speak up against those uh, things. And, and, and even today, given the culture, people are made to feel badly for doing so. Even if they can get away with it without being canceled, they feel sort of guilty about judging other people and gee, aren't I being judgmental? And the next thing you know, they'll be throwing up this out of context quotation from John Paul II, uh, from, I'm sorry, from Pope Francis, uh, who am I to judge and so forth. But that's, you know, we're, we're, we're called to be prophetic. We, we're called to speak the truth in love courageously. Now, to paraphrase a, a popular line these days, I think you'd probably agree that the battle lines between idolatry and faith uh, don't run uh, between the Democratic and Republican Party and don't run between nations, but run through every human heart. Um, so what about, what would you say to those who say, well, I, I accept your point, I accept your diagnosis, I accept that this is a perennial problem and one that everyone is tempted to. And so therefore, what I've got to do is worry about myself, but leave the rest of it to God. It's not a battle for me to fight. It's not something that we have to marshal our temporal forces against, but something that we have to turn inward about, look at ourselves and our families, take care of them, and then let God uh, wage the bigger war of uh, paganism uh, versus the church in the world. Let me tell you something uh, that Christians and Jews have long known about the way God operates. He operates through us. He operates through human beings. Uh, we are called to be his witnesses. That's part of the vocation of every believer, to bear witness to the truths of the scripture, to bear the truths of the natural law, the truths of the gospel. Uh, so we can't let ourselves off the hook by saying, gee, that's God's job. My job is just to take care of myself and live a virtuous life myself and you know, keep my nose clean and stay out of trouble. No, nope. no, nope. it's not how it works, I'm afraid. We're called to bear witness in the world, even in politics. We are called to be the very best of good citizens. The early Christians knew that they weren't uh, fundamentally citizens of, the, of, 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 any, of any place on this earth. They knew that they were fundamentally citizens of a different kingdom. And yet they knew they had to be the best citizens in the temporal sense uh, of the places um, where, where they lived, where they resided, where they were citizens in the worldly sense. They had to bear witness in their lives to those truths, including truths about justice and the, and the common good. So I'm afraid we can't let ourselves off the, off the hook. We might think, gee, it would be nice. Wouldn't it be nice if I could be a really good Christian by just staying out of trouble, not criticizing anything or anybody else or any practices, uh, not ha having people call me names or try to cancel me or try to get me fired from my job or discriminate against me or discriminate against my kids. I just do my thing off in the corner and leave everybody else alone and I can be a good Christian that way. Sorry, that you can't be a good Christian that way because we're all called to bear witness. When, when, when Jesus decided to communicate to his disciples uh, what it meant to be a Christian, what did he tell them? What did he tell them about being a Christian? What was it gonna mean? Well. If you want to be my disciple, he didn't say go off into the corner and pray really hard, although you should pray and you should pray very hard and sometimes you should pray in the corner. But that's not what he said. He said, if you want to be my disciple, take up your cross and follow me. That means render yourself vulnerable to persecution, to criticism, to attack, to assault, to cancellation. It's going to be tough. And it's going to be tough because we're not allowed just to tend our own little garden, withdraw into our own little sanctuaries. Our job is to bear witness in the world, even when it's tough. And you're going to get criticism. You're going to get attacked. You're going to come under uh, assault. You may suffer very grievously. Uh, there will be casualties. You know, we're not going to be completely safe in worldly terms. I wish it were otherwise. So me, I wish I had an easy message, but that's the gospel. The gospel's tough. No, that's a very, very true and deep and powerful lesson. And I think I, I'm very thankful to you for sharing that with us. And I think others are too. Let me flip that on its head for what may be given the time. Uh, one final question, but that seems like a really good lesson for how people in this event and like-minded people should engage 
in the culture and should engage in the politics. Now, those of us who have the privilege of being in the United States or in the West or in other democratic republics understand that we understand with your lesson in mind that we have a role uh, to be out there and to be engaged and to try to, to witness, to make a difference, and as, as cliched as, that's, as that may sound. But part of the title of this event and what we're doing here is, is not just rebuilding the country or rebuilding the culture, but rebuilding the church. And obviously the church for very good reasons isn't a democracy uh, and uh, it isn't a, a participatory um, government in the way that a democracy or a republic might be. And so let's say everyone accepts everything you've said until now um, and, and takes these very important lessons to heart. So what role do we have, do you have, if I can be included, but at least what role do you have in, what role do you have in rebuilding the church, which is not where you can't throw the bums out. I mean, there aren't elections to turn out and to choose and so on and so forth. So what about, let's say we have the courage and we have, how does the rebuilding the church part work? Well, Daniel, let me take this opportunity actually to thank you. I don't think I've ever been able to do this publicly before, but just a thank you personally, not only are you, my star, uh, former uh, former student, uh, not only are you a wonderful uh, professor uh, and uh, public intellectual, but you have done so much to support the faith of Catholics and not just your own students, other Catholics as well. And you've been such a force for the good of the church uh, on, the, uh, on the Villanova uh, campus. It's one of the wonderful things about living today that uh, someone like yourself, um, uh, an Orthodox Jew, uh, can be such a, uh, an important role model and supporter uh, on behalf of uh, the, the, the church. I mean, I've marveled at, at what you've done for our Catholic students, first when you were here at Princeton and now at, at Villanova, and you're such a force for the Catholic mission of Villanova University. <laughs> I, I, some fraction, at least, of the Catholic faculty at Villanova would stand up for the Catholic mission of the university as much as you do. But of course, the church has been wounded like this is a setup, so <laughs> I'm going to ask you to move on to the. <laughs> well, I'm going to I'm going to move on to your question, uh, but I, I was glad for the opportunity finally to be able to say that publicly. But uh, look, the church has been wounded by the bad behavior of Catholics, including Catholic priests, including Catholic bishops. We're suffering tremendously at a time when the church should be on the field of battle. We're suffering tremendously. In fact, we're off the field of battle and giving witness because of the scandals in the church. This has now been going on. Uh, they've been exposed for more than 20 years. They were going on for, for, for longer uh, than, than that. Uh, they were allowed to go on, not only by churchmen, but by lay people, you know, looking the other way or not taking the problems uh, uh, seriously. And, that, and that's got to stop. Uh, I think to some extent we have finally been improving uh, the situation. But there are legitimate demands that the laity have to make when it comes to the institutional church to live up to the true principles, to preach the true gospel. Uh, to um, uh, ensure that, uh, that, that the practices of the clergy and the episcopate are sound and in line with the actual faith of uh, Jesus Christ, with the Catholic faith. Um, sometimes it falls to the laity, and I think this is such a time, to ensure that the church, the great ship of the church, stays on course, stays on track. We can't just treat this as a problem for the clergy. We can't treat it as a problem for the bishops. It's our problem, too. We also have to recognize that in every particular, we as Catholics are the face of the church to the world. That, that's not, again, bishops and priests or only bishops and priests, that's lay Catholics. People understand what Catholicism means by seeing what we actually do. And when, when we embrace bad causes, when we go down bl blind alleys, when we identify ourselves with what's wrong instead of what's right, when we fail to exemplify courage, when we go along with the crowd, we undermine the witness of the whole church. We don't just disgrace and shame ourselves. We undermine the witness of the whole church precisely because we are the face of the church uh, to the world. So um, we, we've got a very important role here in being faithful, upright, very visibly faithful and upright Catholics in calling our fellow Catholics to account when they go off the, uh, the rails and ensuring that the institutional church stays faithful to the, to the actual uh, uh, gospel. Uh, our, our job is not simply to pray, pay, and obey. It never was, uh, and it was a mistake to think that it was. We lay Catholics have to be active. The Second Vatican Council is great on this. They understand that the, 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 the Vatican Council teaches, the Second Vatican Council teaches 
that it is fundamentally the mission of the laity to sanctify the world. The sanctification of the world is an important part of the church's witness. We don't just focus on the other world. We're not that kind of religion. The sanctification of the world in which we live, the temporal order is part of our religion. Who has primary responsibility within the church for the sanctification of the world, for doing justice, for doing right? The laity. Too often we Catholics think, why don't the bishops say something? Why don't the bishops do something? Well, that's fine. We can criticize the bishops when they should be speaking and they're not, or when they're saying the wrong things, or they're allowing bad things to go on under their jurisdiction when they shouldn't. That's fine. Criticize them. That's okay. But don't just leave it at that. We have to remember that the church is not just the bishops and the sanctification of the world, fighting for the cause of justice, fighting for the cause of right, fighting for the common good is more fundamentally our job as laymen and women than it is the job of the episcopate. I wish people would get that through their heads. That is clear, definitive Catholic teaching. So the bishops need to hear from us. The bishops need to hear from us, but the world needs to, more fundamentally, the world needs to hear from us. You know, we, we, when, when the bishops should be speaking and they're not speaking, it's fine for us to say, hey, the bishops should be speaking. But let's not let that be an excuse for us not speaking. It's more fundamentally important that we speak, that we do our jobs, that we hold each other to account, that we exercise our responsibilities and do it rightly. It's more important that we do that than that the bishops do that. Now, they should be doing their job and we can call them on it when they're not doing their job. It's not just pray, pay, and obey anymore. It never should have been that. But my, my, my worry here is so many Catholics think that dealing with the world's problems is a job for the bishops. It's not. It's more fundamentally a job for us. Well, thank you, Professor George. I, I think, I hope I speak for everyone when I say that we feel duly charged with our marching orders and also uh -huh. I wish we all had, I'm sure I speak for everyone today, I wish we had a, another three hours uh, to continue this conversation, continue to unpack um, the excellent ideas that you shared with us. Um, so thank you so much uh, for, for giving us uh, this talk. Thank you, Danielle. It's a pleasure to be with you and uh, my very best to everyone who's participating in the uh, Napa Institute events and congratulations and thanks to the Napa Institute itself, to Tim Bush and the entire team there. Thank you, everyone.